Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Todd Banks, and I'm the Executive Director of the Sherwood Park and District Chamber of Commerce. It is my privilege to facilitate today's event. Welcome Chamber members, Strathcona County residents, and everyone that is viewing from abroad to our first of three events that we are hosting this week to celebrate International Women's Day. International Women's Day is a global day celebrating the social, economic, cultural, and political achievements of women. The day also marks a call to action for accelerating gender parity. Significant activity is witnessed worldwide as groups come together to celebrate women's achievements or rally for women's equality. Marked annually on March 8th, International Women's Day is one of the most important days of the year to celebrate women's achievements, raise awareness about women's equality, lobby for accelerated gender parity, fundraise for female focused charities. The campaign theme for International Women's Day 2021 is Choose to Challenge. A challenged world is an alert, alert world, sorry. And from challenge comes change, so let's all choose to challenge. Today I will introduce our guest speaker, Erica Thomas of Transitional Solutions, Inc., and she will deliver her presentation, Intertwining Strategy into Your Business. Following Eric's presentation, there will be a question and answer session. So please write any questions you may have in the chat box. So let's begin. Erica Thomas is CEO of Transitional Solutions, a management consulting firm in both the public and private sectors. Since at the helm, Transitional Solutions has doubled in size consistently over the past five years. Now with a team of over 35 consultants, Erica finds herself working more on the company rather than in the company, which led her to create a new venture, Pocket Strategist, where she can embrace her passion for helping entrepreneurs build their dreams. Erica holds a BCom, an MBA, an Economic Development Certificate. At the end of this month, she will have added a certificate in mediation to her portfolio. Congratulations. She and her husband have four children under the age of 10 and volunteer and contribute to Kids with Cancer Society and the Children's Wish Foundation. Erica is hoping to encourage her fellow women entrepreneurs through her experience, her expertise, and valuable insights gained from her own experience as a professional woman and a mother faced with the constant pull between career and family. Erica, welcome, and please proceed with your presentation. Thanks, Todd. All right, uh, thank you everybody for joining me today. I'm really excited with the turnout and um, I hope you all take something away from this presentation. So I'm just gonna share my screen here for my presentation and make sure everybody can see that. Okay, so as Todd said, I'm going to be talking about intertwining strategy into your business. And I'm really going to focus on three areas. Understanding and living the why, and that's really why you started your business or why you're thinking about going into business. Then I'm going to give you some useful tools and strategies on building your strategy. And then we're going to talk about how to align that strategy throughout your business. So let's jump right in. Let's talk about understanding and living the why. So this, I think, is probably one of the most important things uh, that a person can do. And honestly, you should be doing this prior to starting strategies, prior to starting your business, and something that you should continue to think about even as you grow your business. And that's really, why did you start the business or why are you considering starting the business? Is it because you want to make boatloads of money? That's totally fine. There's lots of us that get into business to make boatloads of money. Is it about the flexibility that being your own boss provides? Maybe it's about being your own boss. You know, I, I still joke that I don't take direction well. I had to become an entrepreneur because I make a terrible employee. That's great. That's a great uh, starting point. Is it about control? I myself am a bit of a control freak. Probably goes again to the not being very uh, easily managed. 
maybe the business was passed down to you something that's uh, it's a birthright it's been passed on from generation to generation and it's your turn that's okay too maybe it's something that you have like a particular passion towards you should always have passion in your business but maybe it's a subject matter that you're really passionate about and you've decided to jump into business in this passion whatever that is make sure you understand it you embrace it and you continue to hold that that why close to you what were your dreams both in the short and long term for your business I'm going to tell you just a quick story about, about why this is important and why it's important to continue to think about the why and why you went into business. One of the businesses that I coach on an ongoing basis, uh, we started about uh, three months ago. And when we started, we started talking about, she'd been in business for a year and we talked about uh, her bottom line. We talked about revenues. We talked about costs. We talked about scalability and growth opportunities. And what she does is she has a business where she makes uh, vegan meals out of her home and sells them on a weekly basis. And she has about 15 clients. What she wants to do, though, is expand into a commercial kitchen and offer more meals to more clients. So as we're going through this process and, and helping her build her strategy, um, she's talking a lot about this commercial kitchen and getting in there and building the meals. And, and at one point I asked her, I said, why did you start this business to begin with? Well, she'd owned a restaurant in the past and, and liked running the restaurant, but the restaurant really tied her to the business and she didn't have the ability to travel, to take her dog for a walk. She didn't have the flexibility that she wanted. And so she ended up selling that business and then started this business. And so really her why was to own a similar type food business in her passion, which is around vegan meals, but to have the flexibility to do what she wants to do, to travel, to take her dog for a walk, to, to do what she needs to do. But in building her strategy and in building this idea of moving into the commercial kitchen, she actually was building herself back into the business in a way that she wasn't going to have that flexibility. And it didn't even dawn on her. You know, She was excited, she was building the business and she thought next step is obviously a commercial kitchen. But when, we asked, when I asked her the why, she, it was like this big aha moment of, oh man, I'm doing the exact same thing that I did before. And so we were able to shift our strategy and start to build her business in a way that pulled her out of working in the business, giving her more ability to work in the business. And so that's why it's important to continually remember your why. Why did you start the business? What do you want to get out of this business so that you don't build your business in a way that's contradictory to that why? I think it's also really important to understand what drives you and motivates you in your business. What gets you out of bed? What excites you? And make sure you harness that and make sure you build yourself into the parts that, that you love, the parts that you're passionate about. And on the other side, what don't you love doing in your business? Because when you start to, when you get to the point where you need to bring more people on board to help you in your business, bring people on board to do the stuff you don't particularly like to do. Do the stuff that you're passionate about, the things that get you up out of bed in the morning and hand the other stuff off. The, one of the first things I handed off in my business was writing a proposals. I don't like writing proposals. Love working on projects, love building this business hate sitting down and having to write it all down. And so that's the first thing I brought on board when I got to the point where we, we grew to a point where I could bring more people on board. Again, I think it's really important to check in regularly to ensure you're staying true to your why and to see if your why has changed. Sometimes our whys change. You know, if you've been in business for a long time, the reason you went into business to begin with may have changed. Maybe you first went into business to make boatloads of money and you were totally okay with working a 60 hour week, but then your life has changed and maybe now you have a family or maybe now you wanna travel more and that why has changed. That's okay, you just have to strategize and build, build your business around that. If you're in a partnership, ensure that your why is aligned. That's really important as well, or that they complement each other. Um, and here's sort of an example of why that's important. Assume you go into business with somebody and you, um, let's say you start a consulting firm. One of you in the background, your why is you wanna make boatloads of money, which means you're totally okay with working a 60 hour work week. Whereas your partner went into business for themselves because they wanted flexibility. They wanted to be able to travel and golf and fish and ski and do all those things. 
Well, you're going to be constantly frustrated with each other because one is going to be constantly wondering why the other isn't working hard enough and pulling their weight. And the other one's going to be frustrated why, wondering why he can't go, why he or she can't go golfing or fishing or, or skiing all the time and why they're such a slave driver. So make sure if you go into, if you have a partnership, make sure your whys align or complement each other. So now let's talk about building your strategy. Before you jump into building your strategy, it's really important to understand your business. You need to understand who your clients are. Um, if you're already in business and you're, and you're about to build a strategy, whether it's a growth strategy or um, a sustainability strategy, or, or just you jumped into business and you haven't done one yet, and you have clients, are you tracking that client satisfaction? And if you aren't, you should. Um, and this is the perfect opportunity to do that, to help drive your strategy, is do a quick SWOT analysis of strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, threats. Send out a client satisfaction survey. Ask your clients what makes your company strong, where there's areas or opportunities for improvement, and where maybe they would like to see the company grow. It's also important that you understand who the competition is and what gives you a competitive advantage in that, in that market. Can you do things more efficiently, thereby allowing you to price your product a little bit better? Um, are you faster? Is your customer service better? Understand that and play on that and market that. It's also totally okay to be friends and collaborate with the competition. I have lots of competitors in this marketplace where we go for coffee every few months. We call ourselves competitive collaborators because you just never know when there's going to be an opportunity to partner um, or, or buy them out, or maybe at some point you want to sell. Understand your competitor. It's a little bit of that keep your friends close and keep your enemies closer and just be careful that you don't share too much information. Is your current business scalable? And do you even want to scale up? With that same client, I had the conversation because as we were talking about getting into the commercial kitchen, she kept saying, oh, well, if I have a commercial kitchen, how am I going to walk my dog? She just got a brand new puppy. Or how am I going to do this? Or how am I going to do that? And so I had to ask her, I said, do you actually want to do this? You know, you're doing these meals out of your home. You're clearing about $8,000 a month. Why do you want to scale up? And do you, are you sure you want to scale up? I think some people figure that that's just business. You have to scale up. You have to continue to grow. But if your why is about flexibility and your why is about, maybe it's not about boatloads of money, then if you stay true to that why, then maybe you don't need to scale up. But if you do want to scale up, you need to understand whether your business is able to do so. Where are those opportunities? And are you limited in any way? Are you limited in the size of your space? Are you limited in, you know, if you've built the business around yourself only, it's really hard to scale up because you're one person. There's only so many hours in a day. And so think about that when you're thinking about scaling, where are those barriers and where are those opportunities? Also, what do the numbers say about your business? This is something you want to make sure you do on an ongoing basis. You want to understand your per client cost, your per product cost and revenue, um, figure all those numbers out, but make sure, as particularly if you have a hard product, when you're in the service industry, it's a little bit different because you are the product. And so you are obviously building your hours into the product. But the amount of clients that I've coached that have sort of like a tangible product that they sell, where they develop the per product cost to their client without putting their time into that product is insane. So please make sure as you're pricing your products and as you're developing um, those spreadsheets and your numbers, make sure you're building your time into those budgets. So I am a fan of the SWOT analysis. There are a number of different types of analysis that you can do on your company. You can do a SOAR, you can do a PESTLE. I'm a fan of the good old fashioned SWOT analysis. I think the biggest part on the SWOT analysis is do it yourself, invite your clients to do it, invite your staff to do it, invite your partners to do it, invite your suppliers to do it, anybody within your sort of value chain, invite them to do a SWOT analysis on your company. 
allow them, and maybe it's your company, maybe it's a product line, but get them involved. And it can be done through a simple survey, through SurveyMonkey or, or another tool. Get them to identify the strengths of your company, the weaknesses, identify opportunities and threats. I think the biggest thing here, and I'm going to say it over and over and over again throughout this presentation, is make sure you're also involving your team in these processes. Okay, so what should the strategic plan look like? I will say that um, there are a lot of strategic plans out there that are giant documents, and they, they look beautiful on a shelf, but they are really, really hard to implement. So the key things in a strategic plan, so you don't overwhelm yourself, are what I have on the screen here. Vision, that's kind of your why. It's your pie in the sky. It's in a perfect world with no barriers. Where am I going to be five years from now? Your values, I'm not going to take you through a values exercise today, but that's your typical sort of, we value integrity and honesty and customer service. And that's kind of more internal to you and your organization. I think history is a good thing to put in here. I'm not going to take you through it today, but I think having a history in your strategic plan is a great way to monitor where you've been, um, particularly when you continue to update your strategic plan over the years. It also helps new employees coming in see where the company has been, where it's come from. Put your SWOT that we talked about in the last slide, make sure that's in your strategic plan. Then the next three, the, this is the meat. This is where you really need to spend your time. It's around your key priorities, the key deliverables or results out of those priorities, and the tactical plan. Tactical plan is where 99% of strategic plans fall flat. I've seen it in some of the largest municipalities in our province and in our country. They do a really great job identifying key priorities and key deliverables, and they fall flat on the tactical plan. So I'm going to take you through all that today. So vision. One of my favorite uh, sayings or terms is called your BHAG, your big, hairy, audacious goal. So in your business, you should have a BHAG. Where do you want to be? What's your grand vision? Again, like I said, it's sort of like the realistic utopia in a perfect world where there's no barriers, where you just... You, you achieve everything that you've set out to do, where are you going to be in five years? Dream big. And then think about what needs to change in your business to help you grow. Around that, what do you want to achieve in the next five years? Make sure your vision and your why align. That's going to be really, really important. Dream big and focus on success. And think about what your BHAGs are. And you, if you can dream it, where are you and your company going to be in five years? And again, include your team members. I put key team members, but if you can involve all of your team members, do it. I know that sometimes that boardroom table isn't big enough for everybody, but you can involve your team in ways that doesn't mean you're all in the same room. You can involve them in a survey. You could do some workshops. Um, you could even do a virtual session where everyone sort of uh, provides their, their input. Make sure you're involved if you have a board of directors, if you're incorporated and you have a board, have your board of directors. If you have business partners, include them and your key staff. So here's some really cool sample vision statements that I wanted to share with you. Amazon, our vision is to be the Earth's most customer-centric company to build a place where people can come to find and discover anything they might want to buy online. LinkedIn, create economic opportunity for every member of the global workforce. That's a pretty cool one. Like that, that's a BHAG if I ever saw one. Zoom, we're on a Zoom today. Video communications, empowering people to accomplish more. Tesla to create the most compelling car company of the 21st century by driving the world's transition to electric vehicles. Southwest Airlines, to become the world's most loved, most efficient, and most profitable airline. Habitat for Humanity, a world where everyone has a decent place to live. And I'll share with you my BHAG from uh, 2019 was to increase revenue to 7 million and add five new zones outside of Alberta by 2022. Okay, let's talk key priorities. 
this is where you really, you take that vision and you figure out how you're going to achieve it. What are the key areas that you want to focus on in your business or in your organization to get you to that vision? Make sure there's three to five of them. Don't do more than five of them because then it becomes overwhelming and, and too onerous. Also, if you have more than five, likelihood of them being able to be merged together is probably pretty high. So if you can merge some together to make um, three to five, that's better. These should be high level because there will be an opportunity to get deeper into the weeds when we come up with those key deliverables. Broken record, include your team in the development of these key priorities. So some examples of what key priorities might be. Growth into a new market, launch of a new product line, a sustainable business framework, growth of a mobile teaching model. And that one's kind of specific, but I'm, that's one that I'm going to take you through all the steps with. Create a more dynamic and equitable coaching model, another one that I'm going to take you through and organizational capacity. So the bottom four are ones that I'm gonna use as examples as we kind of go through how to identify those key deliverables and results. So key deliverables. These are the measurable deliverables or results that you wanna see over the next few years. This, these should be um, measurable and achievable. You should be able to go back and sort of check the box on these. So you wanna make sure that these aren't pie in the sky, motherhood and apple pie statements. These should be achievable and measurable. So I identified a key priority in the last one, an example, which was growth of a mobile teaching portfolio. So this is a client that I have that has a uh, music studio and they wanted to implement a mobile teaching portfolio. So we came up with three key deliverables with that client. Lisa, with, it's not the actual name of the client, but that's the name I made up for this process. Lisa has an annual increase of 50% to their mobile teaching portfolio. Lisa has six trusted, experienced expert mobile music technicians. See how both of those, I put actual measurements, put some actual numbers to it. And the third one is the mobile teaching portfolio continues to grow organically through word of mouth and current teacher referrals. So the next one is for a completely different, different business. And this was a sustainable business framework. Their key deliverables were a formalized business structure, whether it's incorporated, sole proprietorship, with insurance coverage that covers all aspects of the current business model. So this would be more for like a startup. An organizational chart that creates capacity for Jessica to work on the business and is financially sustainable. When I say on the business, there's a big difference between working on the business and working in the business. Typically, when we first start, we're all working in the business, but as we grow, we need to be able to put other people into those roles, particularly if we wanna grow and scale up and have more time to work on the business and growing that business. So another couple of examples create a more dynamic and equitable coaching model. So this was something that I did with a local gym in our community. So some of the key results were investigation of a new model for compensating coaches, including a possible tiered compensation. Ensure all liability risk is covered through coaching agreements. Perform annual strategic planning with the coaches to ensure a collaborative approach to coaching and programming at the gym and ensure Betty doesn't get burnt out with doing everything. Again, this is Betty was working in the business too much. Find a solution for gym cleaning, purchase of consumables, et cetera. So the last one was around organizational capacity. So this is a key priority from an a association that I managed, the Strathcona Industrial Association. When I first took over that association, there were a lot of pieces that were missing it. They didn't have the organizational infrastructure in place that they needed in order to grow their association. So some of the key results that we developed out of that was the creation of a board charter, clarification of roles and responsibilities and creation of policies and procedures, a new member onboarding package, sustainable long-term membership strategy, mutually beneficial partnerships, and a consistent document management system among all the committees. So 
I tried to give you four very different examples of key priorities from different types of organizations and show you how those key results, or sometimes people call them key deliverables, how those are all sort of measurable, achievable, how they're not, not subjective. That's the key. You don't want your key deliverables or key results to be subjective. You want them to be very much objective and very much measurable. Okay, so now let's talk about the tactical plan. The tactical plan, again, this is where most strategic plans fall short. They do the key priorities. They do the key deliverables. They might even put them on a wall in their office, but they miss the step of taking them down through their company, through their organization with their staff and developing an actual step-by-step -step plan on how they're going to achieve those. And so the tactical plan is literally your to-do list. So let's use a couple of these examples. So key priority one was a sustainable business framework. This was really around that example I told you about the lady with the vegan meal company. So she has been building meals out of her own kitchen, no business structure, no insurance, no anything. <laughs> and so her first step in her strategy really had to be about setting up a business. And so we did a formalized business structure with insurance coverage. I won't read that one fully to you again, but the actions then meet with an accountant to define the most appropriate business model for the long term. Responsibility, obviously, that has to be the owner, which is Jessica. We put in a timeline, which is Q2 of 2021. Resources, this is where you put either your time, if it's going to cost money, so she needs to hire an accountant, then you have to put the hourly rate in there. And then what are the key performance indicators out of that? What's success? Once she can check that box and say it's done, what does she get out of that? Well, by the end of June, the business is registered with the CRA in the province. I mean, success, who wants to pay taxes, but it is, you have to do it. It makes your business actually legitimate. And so that's what success looks like. The other one, investigate and purchase business insurance. Big one, everyone should have that. Doesn't matter what you're doing. So again, Jessica, and by the end of June, the business in is insured, alleviating all liability risk from Jessica. These actions can be as big or as small as you need them to be. So this is your plan. This is your internal document. So if you, for instance, the meet with an accountant, if you need to break that down and say, you know, in March, I'm going to book the meeting with the accountant. And then later in March, I'm going to meet with the accountant. And then in April, I'm going to, if you need to break it down that much in your tactical plan, do it. This plan has to work for you. So another example is an organizational chart that creates capacity for Jessica to work on the business and is financially sustainable. So she has to develop a job description to hire a kitchen manager to get her out of the kitchen. Resources are whatever the hourly rate of the kitchen manager is and the and the success is, is Jessica is no longer building the weekly meals. She also had to hire a delivery person. Jessica is no longer delivering the meals. And development of a policy and procedures manual. If she's going to start to bring on staff, she should have a policy and procedures manual in place. Everyone thinks that you don't need this, that it's an extra step until something happens and then you're wishing you had those in place. So those are just two examples of tactical plans, um, but I think the biggest piece with tactical plan is, is it truly is, it helps you see the step-by-step -step actions that need to happen in order to achieve your key deliverables and your key results, which then help you achieve your key priorities, which gets you to your vision. At the end of the day, your strategic plan is just a plan. It's no different than saying you want to go to Disneyland and getting a roadmap. Unless you actually get in your car and drive, get your oil changes, fill it up with gas, book your hotels, it's just a map. So your strategic plan has to be a living, breathing document. It has to be something that you follow. It has to be something that you check in regularly with your team on. That tactical plan, if you do have a big team, that tactical plan should come to at minimum quarterly meetings to check and see and adjust if you need to. If that doesn't have to be a static document, you can adjust it as you need. 
60% of organizations don't actually link strategy to budget. When we work with municipalities, we take them through the tactical planning exercise so that they can actually, their departments can use that as part of their budgeting process to help them achieve the strategic priorities set by council. 75% of organizations don't link employees' objectives to the strategy. And I'm gonna get into that here in a few minutes on how to make sure that you align your strategy throughout your business, which includes performance objectives of your staff. 86% of business owners spend less than one hour a month discussing strategy. And 95% of the typical workforce doesn't understand their organization strategy. And I can guarantee that likely everybody on this session can go back to a time where they worked for an organization where they had no clue what the strategic vision was, no clue how their job aligned with that strategic vision, no idea on how that all all that intertwined in each other. I know pretty much every organization that I've ever worked for, including public and private sector and some of the largest oil and gas companies in the world, failed at that miserably. So let's talk about aligning strategy throughout your business. Communications is huge. Doesn't matter if you have two staff or 200 staff, it's really important to communicate. Before you start a strategic planning process, you really should communicate with your staff why you're doing it. Because staff get nervous. They always wonder how it's going to impact them. Is it going to impact their job positively or negatively? Does it give them an opportunity to grow? Or is there an opportunity where maybe their job isn't uh, part of the organization anymore? So just communicate regularly. Try to involve everybody, even if it's just a survey. During the strategic planning process, communicate regularly with staff, especially those that aren't actually in the room with you. So communicate at the beginning, communicate throughout the process, communicate after. And that's that once the strategic plan is complete, make sure you're communicating that strategy throughout the entire organization and any other stakeholders that may have been engaged throughout the process. So if you run an operation and you've engaged some of your clients in the process, then don't be afraid to share with them your strategic vision and, and where you're planning on going. Communicate and celebrate all successes as a direct link to the strategic plan. So if you have a, street, a strategic priority or a key deliverable to increase sales by 50%, when you meet that target, don't just say, yay, yay, we increased sales by 50%. Bring up your strategic plan and say, we achieved this, and that's how it's going to lead up to this vision. Always align and connect what you do to that strategic plan. If you're a big organization, make sure you assign one designate per area to the organization that will be sort of that strategy champion. They're able to answer quick questions. They can hold those quarterly or monthly meetings to check in and celebrate those successes. So aligning strategy into performance objectives. Every employee in the organization should have some performance objectives that align to the strategic plan, right down to the person mowing the lawn. So if I were to take Strathcona County as an example, and let's say that one of their key priorities is environmental sustainability. Well, if the person, let's say the summer student mowing the lawns in the summer doesn't understand that key priority, then do they know that they should find a more environmental way of disposing of the grass clippings? Do they know that they should do regular maintenance on the lawnmower to make sure that there's no oil leaks? When they change the oil, do they know that they should use more environmentally sustainable oil? That's how deep a strategy should go and you should include everybody. There's a great story, it's not mine, I've never been to NASA, but there's a story about people going on a tour at NASA and they run into a guy sweeping the floor. And somebody asks him, what do you do at NASA? And he says, we put people in space. He doesn't say, I sweep the shop floor. He understands his role in the organization, but he also understands that he is part of a big beast that puts people in space. So that's what you want to ensure that your people in your organization think about in the strategy. Make them part of the annual objective setting conversation, ensure that their performance objectives are measurable and achievable, and consider rewarding them when they do achieve that. 
If you're in an organization with multiple levels and departments, then ensure the department business plans are aligned to achieve the strategic plan. Also align marketing to strategy. So while your marketing plan is a separate document and your marketing strategy is a separate document, it should almost be an appendix to your strategy and it should align. If growth or increased sales is part of that strategy, ensure you have a marketing plan that gets you there. Don't cheap out on marketing, but also not all marketing is expensive. There's a lot of ways that you can market your organization that's not going to cost you an arm and a leg, but also don't cheap out on it. Do your research on what marketing tactics work best for your target markets and your industry and measure your efforts. Ongoing review. Like I said, the strategic plan is a living, breathing document. It's not something that you build once every three years and put on the shelf. It should be something that you go back to at least quarterly. But if you can do it in all management meetings, in all meetings that you have with your staff, that's even better. For sole proprietors, keep your tactical plan like posted up in your office. And likely if you're a sole proprietor, your tactical plan is going to need to be a little bit more detailed as well. And don't forget to celebrate your successes. So I'm gonna share with you the importance of involving your team. And I'm gonna make this a little bit personal. So my company, Transitional Solutions, in 2019, I brought all of my consultants and we embarked on strategic planning. I brought in a facilitator so that I could fully engage rather than facilitate. We met three or four times for half a day and we jointly worked through a vision. We talked about where we wanted to go, how we were gonna get there. Notice how I keep saying we. It was my company, I owned it. My husband joined in too, so I guess we owned it. But whenever we met with our team, it was a big we. I involved everybody. The consultants that I have, all 35 plus of them, they're not my staff, they're all subcontractors, but they're like family to me. We work collaboratively every step of the way. And I learned early in life to surround myself with people smarter than me, and that has paid off in spades. Through the first quarter of 2019, we continued to have meetings and strategize. We built org charts, plans, we registered for conferences and trade shows, and we bid on projects across the country. My BHAG, as I told you, my vision, was that TSI would increase revenue to 7 million and add five new zones outside of Alberta by 2022. And then on May 1st, 2019, my world turned upside down. My five-year-old son was diagnosed with kidney cancer and he began the fight of his life. I became incapable of focusing on anything except Ben. He immediately began some pretty intense chemo and radiation treatments. For the next nine months, I spent most of my time either in the hospital, <clears throat> excuse me, or at home looking after Ben. When I could, I would pop open my laptop while he slept, but my BHAG was the furthest thing from my mind. In 2019, my company had the highest gross revenue of any year by far. We presented at a national conference, we won two national projects, and continued to attract more amazing consultants. And I had no part of it. My team carried the plan forward because they were part of the plan. They shared my why. So that's why it's so important that you share your why, that you build this together, that you include more than yourself because you're only one person and your world could get turned upside down at any moment. Your strategic plan should be something that lives and breathes. If you find something that doesn't make sense, change it. If things change, adjust your plan. If you don't achieve your key priorities, try again. Refine the tactics, reflect on why you weren't able to achieve them. I don't know, maybe there was a pandemic. That happens, I guess. So that can impact your ability to achieve your strategic priorities. If you fail, try again. So some tips for the entrepreneurs out there. Post your vision and key priorities somewhere where you will see them every day. 
Commit a specific reward in advance for each goal you reach. Include your team and supports in the celebration. Read, read, read. Read books about your passion. Read books about other entrepreneurs. Read books about strategic planning. I know they're really boring and there aren't very many good ones out there, but, but read. Keep your brain going and keep moving forward. Surround yourself with people smarter and more successful than yourself. Give back. If you meet a new entrepreneur and you find a way that you can help them and answer some questions, do it. It's good for both of you. It's good for your soul and it helps them. Sometimes you learn something from them as well. Make sure you connect with other entrepreneurs. Find your network, find your group, whether it's through the chamber. I know the chamber has lots of opportunities, whether it's through a women's entrepreneur initiative or an association specific to your industry, find people that you can connect with. I know everyone knows this, make sure you have a good accountant, a good lawyer, a good banker, and a great marketer. That is huge. If, you're, if marketing isn't your area of expertise, find somebody who it is. Don't be afraid to ask for help. Doesn't matter the size of your organization, there are people out there that can help. There's coaches like me, there's groups like the Chamber and Economic Development. Um, if we can't help you, then we can point you in the direction of somebody that can, but don't be afraid to ask for help. This is a big one and it's International Women's Day. Shout your successes from the rooftops. I'm reading a book called Lean In by Sheryl Sandberg. And she says that men are often seen touting their successes and patting each other on the back. Whereas women tend to hide their successes for fear of being judged. Let's stop doing that. Let's share our successes. If you have a success, tell me about it. I'll be the first one to buy you a glass of wine or take you for lunch. Like, let's celebrate each other. Create those networks, whether it's large or small or both, create those networks. Thank you so much. Um, I just wanted like something for me to give back to. So all attendees have access to a strategic plan template. So all the pieces that I took you through, I put it together in a template that you literally can plug and play. Um, if you have questions and you don't have time to ask them today, send me a note. Um, I also do free 20 minute consults. If you wanna just have a chat, you have some quick questions, send me a note. Make sure you register on our website. So like I said, I, I own Transitional Solutions, but I'm starting sort of another new venture called Pocket Strategist, where I, I help entrepreneurs through strategy. And I'm gonna be doing some strategic planning type workshops in the near future. So just check out my website, erica-thomas.ca and uh, register on there and then you'll, make, you'll get all the information you need. And I promise I'm not gonna bombard you with uh, garbage mail. Um, there's some social media links on where you can find me and I'd be really excited to answer any questions.